Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, um, are there any kids in the house? Anyone younger than, let's say, 14? If you could raise your hand. Okay, if y'all could just leave, inshallah. Why are you laughing? I'm not, I'm not, what's, what's going on here? That's not cool? You can't, get, okay. So, khalas, there's a couple of things, inshallah, ta'ala, um, I wanted to discuss that I might not discuss, inshallah. Just use code but, words. Code words? Okay, so maybe, maybe we'll use some code words. I might need uh, Sheikh Omar's help with that, and coming up with the code words, inshallah. Okay, uh, misconceptions about love. Um, alhamdulillah, I've, I've been in a position for the last uh, almost two years where I get a chance to speak to a lot of people, and I've been put in a position where I very often i am put in front of young people. So one of the outcomes of that is that young people come to me for advice. And the other thing that I've seen is that a lot of young couples come to me for advice. So obviously older couples, they look at me, they're like this young guy wearing this ridiculous leather jacket. We're not gonna go to him for advice. But the younger crowd uh, does come to me for advice. And so for me, these last two years, they've been a learning experience in terms of the types of problems that a lot of the young couples, especially, and not, I'm not, not saying that the older generation, don't, they don't face these problems, but I'm saying I've found it prevalent in the younger generation. And a lot of these problems, what I've, what I've noticed in these last two years is that a lot of these problems stem from misconce misconceptions that young people, and I hate to generalize, but I have to here a little bit, misconceptions that young people tend to have about love and relationships and all of that. So I, I compiled a list, uh, inshallah ta'ala, and I did this, it was the first time doing this, I compiled a short list of my top eight misconceptions, inshallah ta'ala, about love and relationships. Uh, number one, first misconception or first issue, uh, that infatuation equals love, or not being able to distinguish between infatuation and love. Infatuation is the initial feelings of lust and attraction and those butterflies in your stomach, which most people tend to confuse for love. They tend to think that that initial feeling when you look at someone and your eyes meet someone and you feel butterflies in your stomach and in your head there's like a Bollywood movie going off in the background <laughs> and you're in the field somewhere running through or something like that. That is what most people tend to think. They think that is love. And, weird, and yeah, it's kind of weird, it's a little bit weird. Uh, but that is actually infatuation. Those are the initial feelings that you have towards someone. Love, on the other hand, is something that takes time. So, as we know, when a couple, when they get married, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts love and mercy in their hearts, but that's the birth, that's the birth of the love. And as time goes on, the more you put into love, the love will grow and get stronger. Now, one of the issues I found with, with this uh, point is that sometimes young people, they will base their decisions regarding the person that they want to marry or the person they're, that they're in love with based off of their infatuation with them. So they may overlook serious issues of incompatibility, for example. So you have a brother and sister who want to get married, and on the face value, like if you were to talk to them, if you didn't know that they were in love or whatever, you would say you two are never compatible. And most likely, if they were to go speak to a sheikh or an imam or something like that, or they got some premarital counseling or something like that, the, they, it's very likely that the imam or someone would tell them, listen, you guys have a lot of issues that you need to work out before you actually enter into a relationship. Uh, so that's, 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 the first, that's the first thing. SubhanAllah, I remember once uh, a brother came up to me, a young brother, and uh, he told me, he said, sheikh, I'm in love with this girl, da da da, all this kind of stuff. And I said, okay, tell me about her. And I know this brother very well. So I was like, okay, tell me about her. And I was like, if you can, t if you can tell me about her, uh, I'll give you my advice on whether I think, inshallah ta'ala, the two of you will be compatible or not. And then he told me about her, and then I realized that she is very, very different than him. And he was actually a religious brother. She was completely not religious and all of that. And so I said, I, I told him, I said, listen, uh, what's the deal here? Like, I know this is not like you. If I were to ask you normally, I would never imagine that you would marry someone like this in terms of like your religiosity or whatever you want to call it, you guys are on very different levels. And then he tells me, he says, you know, Sheikh, I just, I just felt like the first time I met her, you know, I just felt, it just felt right. And I felt like this is the one. This is my soulmate. Inshallah, we'll talk about soulmates, inshallah. But he said, this is the one. 
And I said, okay, let me just ask you one question. And I said, think about this question and then, and then tell me what you feel about the decision that you're about to make. I said, inshallah ta'ala, this girl or this woman, she will inshallah ta'ala one day be the mother of your children. She's going to be the person raising your children, giving your children the tarbiyah and, and upbringing and all of that. Are you comfortable with this person raising your children? And do you foresee any issues? And then he thought about it for a while and I told him, I said, you know, go home, think about it, come back to me. And then he came back to me and, and he told me, he said, he said I, I don't see it. He said, I never, I never thought that far ahead. And that's the problem in infatuation that people, we get so blinded by this quote unquote love that people don't tend to think beyond the attraction that they have initially. So that's misconception number one. I don't know how I'm gonna keep this under 10 minutes, but I'll try, yeah, we're, we're, so we're finish it. Okay, uh, number two, seven minutes, seven, okay. <clears throat> uh, second misconception that people have about love and relationships is that if someone loves you, so someone, they, they'll tell themselves like, if this person really loves me, then they will change for me. So they'll tell themselves that, you know, even though, once again, we may not be compatible, we may have a lot of issues, a lot of differences, but we love each other. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll, we'll make it work. And I know, like, there's things I don't like about her, but I will change her, inshallah. And out of her love for me, she will change. Or she may be telling herself, out of his love for me, it will change. And as they say, love conquers all, right? Have you guys heard that? Love conquers all. So they say, you know what, we'll get through all of this because of our love. And subhanAllah, this is this once again one of, one of the main issues that I've seen is that when people get over that infatuation stage, they realize that it's very, very hard to change someone else. And it's really that person who ha has to want to change themselves. And once you're no longer infatuated with the person and it's no longer, you're past that honeymoon stage or whatever they call it, five, six months, four months, two months, depending on who you ask, right? Once you're past that stage, it's very difficult. So I always tell young couples, I say, listen, this person, the way they are in front of you right now, the way you see them, marry them, keeping in mind or, or telling yourself that they're never gonna change. And if you're happy with them the way they are right now, then go ahead and get married. But don't make the assumption or don't assume that they're gonna change or don't tell yourself that yes, one day this person will change. <clears throat> Number three, third misconception. That by getting married, you are completing yourself. And as they say, you know, I'm looking for my other half when people are trying to get married. Or people say my better half, you know, sometimes. In the beginning of marriage, especially people say my better half, right? The issue here, the issue here is that when a person tells themselves and they say, I have issues right now, I don't feel whole, I have problems with myself, but once I get married, my spouse will complete me. And all the problems that I'm dealing with in life or my problems with my iman and whatever else I'm dealing with, my spouse will make up for that. Because she has these strengths that I want for myself and I may have some strengths and we'll complete each other. And Islamically, subhanAllah, we don't depend on our spouse to complete us. Our spouse can help, but once again, we can't count on that. Right? And it's also the issue of our relationship being whole with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or at least us striving to make our relationship whole with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and keeping that in mind before we get married. Right? So, and the most important thing, subhanAllah, is, is actually our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And if your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is fine, then your relationship will be helped by that. Right? And so once again, the issue is depending on your spouse to complete you or help you, complete your, your Iman. And a lot of times what happens, one of the other issues I've seen here, is that sometimes we, when you, when you marry someone with the intention that they will complete me or that they will make me better and all that, uh, we tend to leave, put our self-worth in their hands. Right? We tend to tell ourselves that if my spouse, um, you know, they're the ones who are gonna make me feel better about myself. And they're the ones who are gonna make me whole. And we forget, that our self-worth is truly defined, at least according to Islam, our self-worth is defined by our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And that's an amazing, unbreakable thing. That when a person puts their self-worth in their piety or their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they will be secure in their relationship. Because they don't need, they don't have that need to have their spouse always tell them that you're amazing or you're perfect, which is all good, alhamdulillah. It's something that spouses should do. They should encourage one another and, and praise one another. But they don't rely on that single factor to make, them seal, make themselves feel whole or make themselves feel complete. Um, there's a story of Zahir radiallahu ta'ala which Sheikh Umar Sulaiman, I believe, uh, shares in his class. Is that correct? Yeah. And I share it in my class as well, so if you've taken our classes, you've probably heard it twice. Uh, the story of Zahir, it's basically a, it's a very, very, very nice story. But one of the points of the story that I want to mention here is where the Prophet basically, he grabs Zahir radiallahu ta'ala, and the Prophet loves Zahir very much. He's one of the companions of the Prophet He grabs him from, from the back, and then at one point, and the Prophet says, who will buy this slave from me? All right, it's like a joke the Prophet is playing on Zahir radiallahu ta'ala to show his love and affection for him. And Zahir, once he realizes the Prophet he realizes the Prophet is joking with him. He actually moves further into the embrace. He wants the Prophet to hold on to him tighter. And at one point he says, he says, O Messenger of Allah, I think you will find that I am unsellable. That no one will really pay much for me. And they say about Zahir that he wasn't like the best looking guy. Right? He wasn't that good looking or whatever. And he knew that. So he says to the Prophet he says, listen, I... I think you will find that if you try to sell me, like no one's going to pay anything for me. And so the Prophet tells him, he says, most certainly, O oh Zahir, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are extremely valuable. And what, Allah, what, the, what the Prophet is teaching Zahir ta'ala here is that your value doesn't depend on your looks, on what people, how people see you and, and whether they think you're a valuable person or not. He tells him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells Zahir radiallahu ta'ala, he says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala finds you valuable. And here we see the Prophet teaching the companions about self-worth, where their self-worth lies. And it's very important that before people jump into a relationship or get into a relationship, they understand that. That in the end of the day, their spouse may be happy with them, they may be upset at them, they may be proud of them, they may be disappointed with you, like your spouse may be disappointed at you, but your self-worth is directly tied to your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Also, misconception number four. four. There is one single person out there for each and every one of us. And this goes back to the issue of your soulmate. One of the things I talk about in my classes is this issue and how um, pop culture and Hollywood and romantic comedies and all that, one of the things that all this teaches us is that one of your goals in life is for you to find your soulmate that one person out there in the world somewhere who is perfect for you. And they're going to, once you meet them, everything is going to be perfect, everything is going to be amazing. Like I said, if you're in a Bollywood movie, there's gonna be like fireworks and stuff in the background, and you're gonna know this is the person. Right? This is the one person for me. SubhanAllah, I remember the first time I taught my class, uh, after I mentioned the issue of the soulmate, a sister came up to me and she said, Sheikh, are you telling me I don't have a soulmate? And I said, well, it depends. If by soulmate you mean that there's only one person out there who once you meet them, you're going to know there's going to be butterflies in your stomach and everything's going to be amazing and they're going to be perfect and they're never going to say anything to upset you and they're always going to know when to bring you flowers and your mind, you'll be on the same wavelength at all the time, right? Whatever you're thinking, this person knows. If that's what you think a soulmate is, then yes, I'm telling you, you don't have a soulmate. However, if you mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has decreed for you to marry a certain individual, and you want to call that person your soulmate, alhamdulillah, no problem, go ahead and call that person your soulmate. Right? So now, the issue here is when we tell ourselves <clears throat> that there's only one person, and that person will be perfect, and there's going to be no issues and all of that, and I've had this happen to me as well. A sister came up to me, and she said, I'm, you know, I'm having some issues with... Uh, my husband, and we're having problems, and she said it wasn't like that in the beginning, but now, you know, we're having all these issues, and then she says to me something which subhanAllah very, uh, hurt me very much, and it was actually the first time I'd heard this, now I've heard it many times, but it was the first time I heard this, and what the sister said to me, she said, I think I married the wrong person, 
And I said, why? And she said, because I don't think he's my soulmate. Right? And it's kind of like now the issues that they were having were not like major issues, like that are grounds for divorce or anything like that. Right? These were issues where she's like, yeah, I just don't feel that connection anymore. Right? Like, it's just not there. Like, my heart is it's just not there. And, you know, we don't, he doesn't know what I'm thinking. Right? Like, it just doesn't. So I think I married the wrong person. I need to go find my soulmate. Right? That's misconception number four. Number five, once you find your soulmate, they will be perfect. They will be absolutely perfect. There's going to be no issues with your soulmate. Now, seeking perfection is, wallahi, a big problem. And I've narrowed it down to two big issues with seeking perfection or looking for that perfect person, that soulmate or whatever. Number one is that that person doesn't exist, as we said. There's no one who is perfect. So a brother or sister may spend their whole life trying to find that perfect person. And wallahi, you, think, you may think I'm exaggerating, but I once again, I've seen this happen. That what's stopping a certain brother from getting married? This dude's like 35, getting on to 40, right? He's got a job, he can provide for his family, all that kind of stuff, but he's not married yet. Why? His mom brings him a new girl every weekend, right? Check her out. What do you think about her? He's like, yeah, I don't know. There's a couple issues here and there. Uh, let's see what else you got, right? And this has started when the guy was like 25. Ten years later, he's still, look, he's still going through sisters, right? Every day, someone else is like, yeah, I don't know if this person is perfect. You're never going to find that person. There's no single person out there who is perfect. It's something I believe I mentioned in my earlier talk as well. No matter how big of a scholar someone is, no matter how big of an imam they are, no matter how popular they think they are, there is no individual on the face of earth, on the face of the earth today who is perfect, who doesn't make mistakes, who doesn't have certain shortcomings, who doesn't have certain issues. Right, so you're not going to find that person. Number two, the other problem with looking for perfection is that if you marry someone on the assumption that they are perfect, that they are your soulmate, then you're going to be let down very quickly. Right? In a short period of time, you're going to find out that they have issues and they have mistakes. And I get it. I get it. We live in a, in, in a culture where we're told, like you watch TV and you watch movies and things like that. You watch The Notebook, for example. And you're like, oh my God, Ryan Gosling is like perfect in this movie, right? Like, I want that. I want that. Like, so a sister may be watching The Notebook, and she tells herself, she says, that is the type of guy that I want my, for myself, right? I want, I want my Ryan Gosling, except, and this is one of the things I often say, I want my Ryan Gosling, except I want him wearing a thobe, and I want him with a beard, <laughs> right? That's the difference. That's the difference between that Ryan Gosling and, and my Ryan Gosling. This person doesn't exist and you're gonna have issues if you marry someone with the assumption that they are perfect. Even, like I said, I, I get it, we live in a culture, even SubhanAllah, and this is an issue which I was debating whether to bring up here or not, but I, I think this is an issue which is common now, even in the Islamic circles, even in like the, da, the way da'wah is, is, is uh, the da'wah scene is right now, uh, a lot of young people look up to speakers. And, and scholars and, and, and people who are well known, and they just assume that this person, because they're on stage, because they're giving a talk, because they have knowledge and that, that they are perfect, that they have no issues. And that is, Naam? Don't blow our cover. <laughs> he said, don't blow our cover. I'm about to <laughs> blow your cover, cover really hard right now, Shaykh <laughs> I'll, sh I'll share a story with you, okay? <clears throat> this is a story that happened with a close friend of mine. I actually shared the story in my class as well. So if you've taken my class, you've heard the story before. Uh, a close friend of mine who's a well-known speaker, and I'm not going to say his name, but if I said his name, I would imagine that almost everyone in this room would know who this person is. This, uh, this brother, may Allah protect him, he was uh, the imam of a community for a long time. So he'd get a lot of phone calls. People would call him with issues and this and that. So one day he gets a phone call, and it's his sister. And it wasn't odd because, you know, like I said, he's the imam. People call him with their problems and all that. So he gets a call. And he picks up the phone, and it's his sister. She says, Assalamu alaikum. He says, Wa alaikum assalam. And she goes, Sheikh, I'm in love with you. <laughs> and this brother, mashallah, one thing I say about him is this guy's a boss, right? He's, he's a boss. So you know what he says to her? He goes, Sister, you're not in love with me, you're in love with your perception of me. You're in love with who you think I am. 
He says, if you only could talk to my wife, she would tell you. <laughs> I'm not done with the story yet. <laughs> he said, if you could only speak to my wife, she would tell you how I make her cry every single day. Right? And he slammed the phone. Right? So we assume that because people may be good looking or whatever, like Sheikh Omar Sademan, obviously, right? <laughs> and they're a public speaker. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is here, dude. You don't really care. <laughs> All right, you can go on <clears throat> Anyway, the point is perfection doesn't exist, right? Even in people who look amazing, and they may be very amazing people, like I know Sheikh Omar said, man. All, all, all jokes aside, all jokes. <laughs> All jokes aside, I love him for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> okay, moving on. What, what point was that? Number five, four, six? Six, six. I, I promise I'm almost done. I know I'm like five minutes over my time. Do you guys allow me to continue? No. Okay. <laughs> Number six. Number six, the sixth misconception people have about love is that love is effortless. Or love is supposed to be effortless. That if you love someone and they love you, and you know, if they're your soulmate and all, that love is not going to require any work. That you don't have to put anything into your relationship. You either love the person or you don't. And the reality of the matter is that love the truth is that love always requires work. And that's, that's love in your relationship, not only with your spouse, it's with anyone who you love, right? Even your parents, who you have that natural inborn love, you can increase that love, you can strengthen that love by being obedient to your parents, for example, right? doing things for your parents, being kind and generous to your parents, or you can decrease that love by being disrespectful to your parents and things like that. And even, subhanAllah, walillahi mathalun a'la, and for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the highest example, even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can increase our love for Allah if we are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The more obedient we are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more of our life we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more we strengthen our love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the more we disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the, the, the more we disregard the obligations and all of that, the, what we will find is that even with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our love for Allah will weaken, right? Love requires work. And this is something a lot of young people, they just don't get this, right? It's the whole concept of either you love some person or you, don't, or you don't love some person, and they don't realize that love indeed requires a lot of work. Number seven, that true love, the seventh misconception, that true love is unconditional. That if someone truly loves you, and you love them, or let's say, and I'm actually, once again, I get another case study. Uh, someone came to me, I was talking to this couple. Um, they're having issues with one another, and one of, one of the things that I came to realize is that they had very unrealistic expectations from each other. And then one of the problems was that the, the sister when talking to her, I realized that she, her concept of love is very skewed because she believes that her husband has to love her no matter what, right? Whether she's a good wife or not, whether, what she does or not, it doesn't matter. This is your soulmate. The love will always be there, right? It does not depend on what you do for your spouse. And same thing, like, the same thing happens on the guy's side as well. And especially, I would say especially on the guy's side where a guy says, you're my wife, you have to love me no matter what. Right? Or, or especially like if you believe you married your soulmate, that because you're my soulmate, this love will be there. It doesn't matter how we treat each other or what we do, that love cannot be broken. And once again, when people begin to see that their love is, doesn't have that same factor and that their spouse doesn't love them unconditionally, they may resort to saying something like, maybe you're not the right person for me. Maybe you're not my soulmate or something like that. Lastly, last issue is that you're always ready for love as long as it's the right person. I'll say it again. You're always ready for love 
as long as it's the right person. So basically, it doesn't matter where you are in your life, it doesn't matter uh, how much you've done or what you're capable of and all of that, none of that matters. When you find the right person, when you find your soulmate, for example, then that is the right time to be in love and that is the right time to be in a relationship. You're always ready, as long as it's the right person. And the truth of the matter is, this is one of, and this is, I know I put this at the end, but this is one of the biggest issues that I've seen. You know, about, I would say, 10 or 15 years ago, before I went to Medina, when, when I remember back in the day when I first started practicing Islam, when there was a revival in the da'wah, there was a lot of speakers coming on the scene and people calling to Islam and all of that, one of the things that a lot of speakers would say, they would always encourage the youth to get married young. Right? The scholars and, and the speakers in, in, in America, they would tell young people, like, listen, you're young, there's so much fitna in this society, there's so many issues, so many problems, so many temptations, so one of the things you can do to protect yourself is to get married young. And subhanAllah, because of that whole era, we're actually seeing the, the, well, some of the problems of that era today. And one of the problems is that people jumped into relationships back then unprepared. Right? They were like, okay, the only thing that matters is that I find someone and I get married. So people would get married and they don't understand some basic things that a person should know before they enter into a relationship. For example, just the simple fact or understanding that men and women are different. There are times when women react differently to situations and men react differently. There's nothing you can do to change the person. There's going to be the times when your spouse reacts in a certain way and you just cannot understand it. You have no choice but to accept it. You can bang your head on the wall, you can go crazy, you can pull your hair out, you can do whatever you want, but this is how she understands the situation. Right? And so you, have, you just have to accept that at certain times. Like the understanding that there are certain differences between men and women. Uh, one of the things the scholars of the past, they would say, subhanAllah, is that, and I think this needs to be revived today as well. They would say that it is impermissible for a person to get married until they understand the rulings of marriage and divorce. The fiqh of marriage and divorce. At least the basic fiqh of marriage and divorce. And subhanAllah, how many people today get married and they don't have a clue? A single issue happens and it's like, I don't know what to do, call the imam, start freaking out because they have no idea. And a bigger issue than that is not understanding the rights and responsibilities that you have as, as, a, as a spouse. And subhanAllah, uh, one of the misconceptions brothers have is uh, that my only responsibility, for example, is I have to provide her with food, shelter, and clothing, right? And especially like, this is something I saw from religious brothers who like, you know, maybe are not providing well for their family. And when questions say, listen, what's the deal? Like, why aren't you providing for your family? And she has certain needs and wants and all that kind of stuff. Why can't you provide that? And he says, listen, it's shar shar'an, according to the sharia, ah, the only thing the sharia ah asks of me that I'm required to do is provide her with f uh, um, food, shelter, and clothing. And subhanAllah, that is a very limited understanding of what the sharia ah requ requires. Right? So not having the knowledge of what a relationship takes. And this is why one of the things that I always tell anyone who comes to me for advice regarding getting married, I say always, always, always get premarital counsel. Right? Always. For me, like if someone wants me to do a nikah or something, I'll be like, listen, I'm not touching your nikah with a 10-foot pole unless you can prove to me that you've gotten some premarital counseling done. That you can show to me that you know what it means to be married. You can, uh, you've had to at least think about some of the situations that will come up when you get married, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. That's my top eight list, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah ta'ala, our uh, shaykh and the brothers can add to what I've said, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. <coughs> Yeah, let's just go to the panel. You guys have questions, I'm guessing? You look a little, I think you're just a little over 17, though. <laughs> I, I'll get to your question, inshallah. I want to hear from some, I want to hear some young, nervous voices. <laughs> oh, they're hiding over there. Yes.
Assalamu alaikum. Um, so this is something I thought about a lot, about having premarital counseling for young people before they get married. Why do you make that woo sound? <laughs> okay, go ahead, go ahead. Um, is there some, mashallah, all of you guys up there and all the other speakers here, is there something that you guys are working on that perhaps all the imams that marry um, people off should have some form of that at every single masjid, maybe start something up? I mean, there's a lot of leaders here probably present already, but I think that's something really, really important for our um, community, and I'm wondering if anybody's working on it. I don't know. Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in the meantime, no, I, I think in all seriousness, it's interesting you bring that up. Me and Sheikh Yasser Burjas, uh, I know in particular, mashallah, has, has stressed this, and we've talked quite a bit about it in the last few weeks, at the, actually in the last few weeks, because we had specifically a couple requests that... Um, and, of course, that's in Dallas. Uh, but, I mean, I think that I think in the meantime, uh, finding someone that you trust, finding a local imam that you trust, someone that can do that. But we are developing, inshallah, I hope we do develop a system soon enough, inshallah. I definitely see the need, and I think that uh, it's our responsibility because as we're up here, we're constantly talking about get premarital counseling, and I don't think that going to... And, I, and I'm not saying that we discount all non-Muslim services and secular services, but I, this is one particular area where I don't think you should go to just, you know, marriage counselors or whatever, get premarital counseling from a secular uh, perspective. Uh, so yes, inshallah ta'ala, we, we are working on it, inshallah. And I, in the meantime, uh, I think one good thing to do is, uh, I think, is it Sheikh Walid's Fiqh of Love that's out or something like that? Or, Sheikh Yasser Burjas has his Fiqh of Love out or on CD or something like that, on, like as a whole CD set. I think it's just good to study material together, like to read some books together on responsibility, rights and responsibility, and listen to, listen to some lectures in the meantime. Um, and inshallah, I think you'll see something within early next year, inshallah. Within uh, I'd like to just add one quick comment about that. Um, there are a score of services that Muslims need uh, that need to be provided, but the reality of it is we have way too many Islamic centers and way too many masajid and way too many communities for realistically all of them to be able to provide these things in the near future. That's just not going to happen, right? So in the meantime, we have to work with whatever resources we have. And I think, I, I, don't, I don't discount the value of providing services online because it's changed literally countries and the way they provide education, right? So... Uh, I think we have real opportunity to create online solutions for these kinds of things. And of course, the ideal scenario is every masjid has their own trained certified counselor that can handle things from an Islamic perspective. I would, I would second Sheikh Omar's concern. Uh, I would also second uh, you know, Sheikh Taslim's opinion of Omar's appearance. But also, <laughs> I would uh, but I'd sh second, I had to do it, sorry. Okay, no, no, I'm, I'm not sorry. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> So, but, but I sh I'd second the concern that we do need to have. Um, that I, I wouldn't go to secular institutions for this sort of thing because the prophetic model of what it means to have a healthy relationship is very different from the secular psychology model of healthy relationships. Actually, the entire s modern counseling, modern psychology premise is that you are meant to be alone. <laughs> That you're not actually, you, the only person you look out for is yourself at the end. And the only time you give someone is if it's of some, some sort of benefit to you. So it's almost like capitalism, looking out for number one, entered into the world of psychology. And that's what's being counseled. That's actually what's being given. So it's poisonous, as a matter of fact, in many, many situations. So I don't recommend it at all. Uh, in the, and that's what I'm talking about. In the meantime, I think what we're going to do in Shalata is we'll have an online basically just a guide as to what material each person, each prospective spouse should read. Um, and at the same time, some lectures they can listen to and things of that sort. And also like a questionnaire, some important questions that you should ask. Because look, marriages are not going to end because you guys don't have the same favorite color. Okay, so if you're sitting around and asking questions like that, you're wasting your time. Um, but inshallah ta'ala, I think we'll have like an important questionnaire and stuff like that. I had some issues that I wanted to bring up in this conversation, so I'm just going to bring them up. Um, I thought that, you know, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Saad's eight points are actually brilliant, and it's a really comprehensive analysis of a lot of what's going on. 
Um, and it actually, anything I could think of probably falls under one of these eight, so it's really awesome. Um, one of the things that a lot of people are uh, suffering from in our times, uh, men and women, is low self-esteem. Right, so you have a very low opinion of yourself, and so when you do find someone who's even remotely interested in you, all of a sudden your world becomes meaningful again because somebody sees worth in you, and this goes back to his self-worth point. Right? And so a lot of people are really gung-ho about getting married to this girl or this guy uh, because it was the first one who came along and they're like, well, you know, lightning don't strike twice. I mean, I know what I look like in the mirror and this person has bad enough of an eyesight to go with this. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I know, I know, seriously. But they have this going on inside the head that, you know, yeah, for a lot of people. No, 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 I, I, I do think that, but yes. <laughs> But the, the, the idea that, you know, nobody else is ever going to come along, uh, you know, I have this chance, even though this is not the perfect kind of person for me, but I should settle. On the one hand, we don't look for someone perfect, but on the other hand, you shouldn't be settling also. Uh, and, and especially as a result of a low opinion of yourself, you shouldn't be doing that, you know. Um, another quick point that I wanted to make uh, about this same topic of, you know, looking for a spouse and trying to get married. You know, one of the things I've come across with guys especially, and also with girls, is you know, these points are, these, these concerns are very logical, reasonable, common sense observations that one can analyze themselves with. But you know how the Arab says, Laysa fil hubbi mashura, um, that once you fall in love, apparently, or you are obsessed enough, you're infatuated enough, then uh, logic and common sense and reason and rationality goes out the window. So it doesn't matter how much somebody tries to talk sense into you, once you've been, like, infatuated enough, you're a mule. You're just you're no good. So if you can come back to humanity a little bit and de detox from your obsession, then this conversation actually makes sense. Because when, if you've gone far enough down the road, you're too emotionally invested to even think about this stuff. Right? So you have to decide where you are. And, uh, and for just a, a little ad additional comment to the, you know, thinking that you're going to change someone once you get married. Well, your parents, who love you more than anyone who will ever love you, can't change you about this issue. Because you want to marry someone, and you're not listening to them, and you're not listening to the, the fact that you're 16 years old, or that you're, you, know, you don't have a job, and you know, any of it. You don't want to hear any of it. And you, you say they're not perfect, but I can change them. Well, the ones who love you so much and raised you up, they can't change you. How are you going to change anybody else that you don't even know? It doesn't even make any sense. You know? So we have to be uh, uh, very realistic about this subject. Inshallah, later on in this conversation, we'll, I'd like to take more questions, and they're coming in. Uh, I'd like to shift gears about this conversation, and the comments I wanted to share were actually about the process by which the Muslim community goes about getting its young people married. The process itself, which I see is deeply flawed, is deeply, deeply cracked, and it's producing a lot of the problems that we're having in marriages are actually as a result of the process. How do you get to the point where you get married, right? So inshallah, hopefully we'll have some conversation about that. Um, let me answer this one because this is like my pet peeve in the Arab community. Um, what do you think of college students going and doing the Fatiha stage and waiting till after college to get married? All right, listen to me very closely and especially Palestini parents and everyone. There is no such thing as a Fatiha stage. Qiraatul Fatiha is zawaj is bid'ah. It's an innovation. I know we hate that word. It doesn't exist. It's an innovation. And subhanAllah, innovations actually make things difficult in the Muslim community because people started thinking it actually has legal implications. Like this is a, a part of... So for those of you that are looking around, like what are they talking about? You know, That's like most of the room. How do you are Daisy here? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so let me, let me uh, do a translation for you guys. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Qarat al-Fatiha is when they all sit around and they go, they go, all right, guys, here's, this is the engagement phase. Everyone, al-Fatiha, and everyone raises their hands, they read, alhamdulillah, rabbi, and they, and I don't even think they really read it because they get it done in like three seconds and they wipe their faces and now they're some, in some warped way engaged. And then we all eat hummus and we party with pizza like we always do. Let me translate this for you. It's called baat paki okay, yeah. Okay, it's the baat paki. There's no such thing as baat paki. Okay, just, just so you guys know what he's talking about. I have no about. idea what he just said. Yeah. Uh, That's but, what but important question, and it's funny because one time someone actually came to me and was telling me, Sheikh, we did the, and this happens a lot, we did the Fatiha, we did the Fatiha, so what do we have to do now? Right? And I'm like, oh no, maybe you should like read Surah Al-Baqarah together and undo. 
<laughs> and you know what's funny? They actually did it. Like this dude actually went back <laughs> and they read Surah Al-Baqarah. And it was like Sheikh Omar said, we got to read Surah Al-Baqarah. Like, I'm not joking with you people anymore. There's no Fatiha stage. But I'll answer the question that I think is trying to be asked. Should the engagement period be prolonged? From my experience, no. Prolonged engagements tend to fall apart very, very, very quickly because it builds a sense of frustration. Even like those really long, you know, when they talk about the halal dating thing where you do the kitab, um, you know, which is the actual marriage, okay? Look, in Islam, there's only one legal hurdle, and that is nikah. After that, the walima is sunnah, okay? All the other stuff that takes place in between, that's culture, all right? And before culture, there's only one legal hurdle, and that's nikah. So like, we'll do the kitab, and then we'll get married two, three years later. It, it's, it works, it might work for a few people, but I'm telling you, I mean, the vast majority of people, it doesn't work, it builds a sense of frustration, because like, I'm married, but I'm not really married. Like, I'm religiously married, but I'm socially engaged. You know, when are we gonna actually get married? Interestingly enough, there was an article, I don't know if you guys saw this article, that, um, that relationships that have a greater portion of text messaging are actually the most unhealthy relationships. Did you see that one before? No, That's an article I just saw last week on, on, in the Huffington Post, like an actual study on relationships that have a lot of text messaging are actually unhealthy relationships. And that's why, you know, uh, even that prolonged pre-kitab phase, getting to know each other for the sake of marriage, we're not really doing anything, it tends to build frustration and the relationships fall apart. So I don't believe in a prolonged engagement phase. I think that it's a healthy, and I really mean, I, I also don't like the, and, and this is the Desi culture, I know the kitab the day before the, the wedding. I don't think that that's a good idea either. I think having uh, maybe, a, you know, a, a, a few months, a month, two months, three months, you know, where they can get to know each other, where they can get comfortable, uh, getting to know each other, I think that's more healthy because what I see is that most people that do that kitab at the end anyway, the day before the marriage or the day before the wedding, uh, there's already inappropriate interactions. So you might as well m make it halal to where they can talk about some serious issues and it also, you know, they're, they're going to be busy for those two, three months planning the wedding anyway. Um, so I think that's a healthier, a healthier uh, kitab phase, okay, or nikah phase. Uh, to, the, to the time of the wedding or to the time where the woman would move in with the man. And I'm telling you, I know that the parents are here. Uh, a lot of our parents who got, who got married back home, and mashallah, it worked. But you, if you tell your kids, like, I married your mom without ever seeing her before, all right, you scare your children, all right? I'm not doing them a favor with that, all right? It's just not going to fly over here. And it's actually not the sunnah, per se, because the Prophet ﷺ said, you should look at her, you should look at the person that you're going to get married, obviously with what appears and, you sh you know, that's where the, the, the restriction is lifted so that you can see that you're satisfied with that person. And I think that that's something that's also uh, important. Allah Alam. Sorry. Okay, so I sifted through these questions. No, the MC of the session is not available. He's married or engaged. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, moving along. Like yeah, I, I mean, I, I love the Jesus look. I mean, it's it's fantastic. But anyway, anyway, so I just, um, sorry, no, it's beautiful though. I like it. What are you talking, guys? I love Kaiser. Come on, come on, Kaiser. Love you. Okay, anyway, so um, there's some really nice questions here, and I think um, uh, one of them I'd like to give some comments to as as we get through them, and I'd like to hear you guys' uh, positions on this too. Um, what, what is one advice you'd give to guys who are too young or to young kids who are really anxious to get married? Uh, this is actually a really important uh, conversation because, of course, uh, when we push this idea that the halal outlet is nikah and then a kid hits, like, puberty, uh, then problems begin, right? So what, how are they supposed to channel that energy and that enthusiasm uh, into something that's legitimate? And, of course, they just say, I need to get married, I need to get married. So you have like 16-year-olds, 18-year-olds coming up and saying, I want to get married, or whatever. And they give the examples of Sahaba, you know, and, uh, which is cool, but those same Sahaba that were teens were also generals of armies, and they were doing things with their life. So let's take a break here for a second. And, I mean, you're a general of an army, but, you know, PS3 and, like, you know, <laughs> what is that video game again? Modern Warfare? That doesn't count. You're not, you're, that's not the real military. But anyway... Um, my, my suggestion to young men who are interested in getting married is I wouldn't put a barrier on your age. I would be, wouldn't be one to do so. Every, you know, uh, people mature differently. 
What I would argue is what are the, what are the standards of maturity? If you're able to provide for yourself, if you have a clear plan of action for your career, even if your parents are supporting you, you're disgusted by the idea because you're a man and you want to be able to live on your own terms. And instead of being feeding off of your parents, you want to be contributing to your parents and making their, their life easier. And you have this like, sense of responsibility that drives you. If that is not the case, and you're one of those Xbox 360, PS3, all-nighter, you know, every new movie comes out, Netflix and Hulu addict, whatever type, and then you say the Sharia says I can get married when I'm of the age, then you need to stop uh, even bringing this up. And, uh, you know, because you, you don't even buy those video games. Your mom buys them for you for Eid. <laughs> so, for, you know, first of all, so. Grumpy old man. Yeah, I am. I am really grumpy about this subject. <laughs> because what happens with these guys is uh, they turn 25, 30 years old, and they're still not men. They're, they're kids. They're not grown. And uh, this is one of the things that Desi parents have done to their children. They've paid for everything, and you've kept them from turning into men. Get your kids a job, man. And, and yeah, honestly, make them work and make them pay their own college tuition. Make them work. Get them involved in the real world. It'll turn in, them into men, you know. This is, actually, there's a book I recommend to everybody here, especially fathers of, of young boys. Uh, boys Adrift. I forget the author's name. I've read halfway through it. I'm fascinated by this book. Boys Adrift. This, the idea that in modern society with the profuse availability of time-consuming entertainment, there's one thing that you have fleeting enter entertainment, but there's this time-consuming entertainment culture that boys are actually l losing their eagerness to want to be men and contributors and to actually stand up and do something and make a change in society. They don't have that drive anymore, so kids are just sitting there unmotivated, and you, ha you change your major five times, and you're asked, well, what do you want to do? Oh, I don't know, I don't know, I, I, whatever, you know. Well, what's your major now? Well, accounting. Do you want to work in accounting? I'm not sure. I, I don't know. You know, what is that? That's not, uh, you know. So this is, this is something that we really, really have to address. Uh, and until we do, then the, the, the marriage conversation is off the table. I mean, yeah, I'm an advocate of you know, young people getting married. But I'm also an advocate of young people actually turning into men, you know, not, not staying boys. So that, that's a really important thing to discuss and, and instill into our community. You guys? I'd just add on to that, that one of the, again, I, I actually read that whole book. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that I have seen as a dilemma in our community. And this goes to men and women. Um, it goes towards young men because, look, you need to learn how to, you know, one of, and one of the hardest tests that a marriage will face, by the way, is financial issues. I mean, when, 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 they're, when you're having financial difficulties, that's a very, very difficult test for a marriage. It puts a huge strain on the marriage. Um, again, there's this idea sometimes from, from, you know, the immigrant parent background that I want to give my kids everything that I wasn't able to have growing up, so I want to make sure that 16 years old, they have the most amazing car in the world that they never have to lift a finger. All they have to do is go to med school and everything's going to be okay. And, um, and that's very, very, very dangerous to them. And this is actually anti-sunnah. I mean, the Prophet Sallallahu we see that when he was growing up, and this was, this was one of the good cultural practices that Al-Waqidi says was maintained after the sunnah, which was that a kid would be sent into the desert to basically fetch for himself to learn how to be a man, to learn how to take responsibility, to learn these types of things. They were trained for battle. They were trained as horsemen. They were trained. I mean, people were, people were, were, were responsible at that young age. Um, and yes, you can't invoke the sharia and say, my parents are not letting me get married if you expect your parents to still provide for you after you get married. It would be great if parents, and it is great for parents to support their children getting married and to even help. I don't have a problem with that at all. Um, but it is very important for you to learn how to buy your first car, change the flat tire on your car instead of just calling AAA, kill a cockroach or a rat, okay? Um, get a part-time job, struggle, all right? Uh, try to balance out multiple things. Try to balance multiple things in your life. Those things are extremely, extremely, extremely valuable. And for sisters too, sisters... And, and I'm not even talking about the whole discussion whether, the, you know, this is, this is a couple in which both the husband and the wife work. Um, if both the husband and the wife don't know how to cook, <laughs> and you guys are going to get fast food every day, that's going to be a serious issue, okay? Even if it's Zabiha, <laughs> it's going to be a serious issue. All right, he's satisfied with chocolate milk, like, for <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner, mashallah. All right? But most people are, are not like that. Brothers and sisters, you need to learn how to cook. You need to learn how to deal with, you know, 
deal with, with, with a small amount of money. And what I see a lot of times that happens also is that, all right, you know, I'm going to move from a house, and I'm talking about the sisters too here, I'm going to move from a home in which I was basically raised in a mansion, and now I have to move to an apartment, and we got to worry about, you know, not just spending whatever we feel like spending and things of that sort. That's dangerous. That's killing the marriage before it even starts. Learn how to earn for yourselves. Learn how to be responsible. Learn how to struggle. Um, the most precious days of my marriage, I remember, you know, my wife, alhamdulillah, had a scholarship, so we used to get Subway every single day with her scholarship. Veggie patties, of course, all right? And every single day, get, get Subway. You know, that's how, that's how we made ends meet. And every single, every single month, we'd break even. Alhamdulillah, you know, till today, those types of things, till today, she goes to Walmart, she'll have like 20 coupons, right? Like, we learned how to struggle. We learned how to, how to make ends meet. We struggle together. And that's something that is, is missing in a lot of marriages. So learn how to buy your first car. Do not expect your parents to pay for your wedding. Say, you know what, Dad, Mom, I'm going to pay for my wedding. Even if it's going to be a broke, beat-down wedding and, you know, in, in, some, you know, in a police station or something like that. You know, hopefully not because you're arrested. <laughs> All right, that's a bad example. Fire station. Fire station. All right. Because that actually happened one time <laughs> in a fire station. Okay. And yes, there were guests and everything, and I did the nikah there. It was pretty cool. Um, but the point is, is that whatever it is, I'm going to pay for my own wedding. I'm going to pay for my car. I'm going to pay for my apartment. I'm going to pay for my house. You know, if, and if the parents want to help with that, alhamdulillah, that's, that's a good gesture, I think. Like, I'll contribute. You know, I'll help to make, to make you, uh, you know, until you can get on, stand on your own two feet. But in the meantime, go into marriage with the expectation of struggling, of being more responsible, both brothers and sisters. <laughs> Bismillah. Uh, just one of the things I wanted to add to, um, I, think, I think Sheikh Omar Sadiman mentioned about extended engagements or extended basically where you get your nikah done and then you work, wait for a long time before you get your walima done to basically consummate the marriage. One of the issues that I've come across is that uh, I, pr I believe as well it's not, it's not a great idea. And one of the things that I've seen is that sometimes someone, there's a couple, they get their nikah done and they get married but they're not living together. And sometimes they live like far apart. So what do they do in the meantime? They're, they're texting and they're talking on the phone and uh, Skyping and all that kind of stuff. And eventually what happens is when you're talking every day for a long time, you run out of things to talk about, right? So basically you know everything about this person now. You know their favorite color, you know their favorite movie, and this, like you've thought of every single question, and you, now you know that. So then you start discussing hypothetical issues, right? So you're like, okay, so inshallah one day when we have a kid, what do you want to name the kid? And then she'll say, well, if it's a boy, I want to name Muhammad, or if it's a boy, I want to name him Ahmed. And then he's like, you know what, I don't like that name Ahmed because I knew this kid in high school and his name was Ahmed and he was a jerk. <laughs> so I hate that name. And she's like, what are you talking about? It's my uncle's name and I love him. And they're having, they, now they start having issues with something which is hypothetical. And things like this can come up very often and they may, they may, it may lead to arguments. And the problem is that that in a situation like that, when you're not living with the person, and you're not there, you're not in that relationship, uh, it's harder to solve these issues. You see, when you're married and living with a person, it's, these things are easier to get over, because you have, um, to put this in a PG uh, terminology or PG way, you have an intimate, physical relationship with this person. So at the end of the day, you all are going back to the same bed, for example. And these minor things, they don't matter. But when you're not, you don't have that close physical contact, these small things can end up becoming big things. And, I, and I've, I've, I've seen cases where people are, they seem completely compatible, everything's great and all of that, but they started talking and they talked for a long time, and then they realize, oh, we have these issues or whatever, so once again, we're just not right for each other. When these issues are really not big issues, right? Allah Adam. Okay, uh, there's a question here about uh, something I mentioned regarding change or not, like, don't assume that the person's uh, going to change. What I was saying here, and the person said, does that mean that we are not supposed to change ourselves? I was speaking about the other person, right? So never assume that the other person is going to change. It doesn't mean that you yourself don't work to change yourself and to better yourself, right? And this reminds me actually of a, uh, a joke that psychologists always tell. Any psychologists in the house, by the way? Psychologists? or psych majors? Okay, 
How many light bulbs does it, how many, sorry, how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Okay, only one, but the light bulb has to want to change, right? So the point here is that you cannot make someone change, right? You have to want to change, and you can do it for yourself. And you can set goals for yourself and say, you know what, there's a, there's a, there's a certain place I want to be in my life, whether it be financial goals or emotional, emotional goals or goals with your maturity and all of that before you get into a relationship. A lot of them. Uh, there's another question here, and this, is, um, this question is uh, from a sister, I believe, who is divorced, and she has a question about a particular situation that she's in. Now, the reason why I, I actually brought this question out is because this leads me to a bigger issue. And that issue is a lot of times people come to things like this, open Q&A sessions or Q&A at, at a conference and things like that, and they take these questions that actually need more than like a two minute answer. Or an answer where the Imam or the Sheikh only has like three lines, and I don't wanna show you the question, but there's like three or four lines here. There's no possible way I can do justice to giving advice in a situation like this. Right? And one of the problems that we're facing now is that we lead complex lives and we have complex situations and we seek very simple answers. So we'll go online and like Google our Islamic question. Or a parent may Google a certain issue and then take that issue. You know how I mentioned in my first lecture, like the fatwa hammer? That's what it is. Right? People go online or something like that and they get a fatwa and they don't realize that this fatwa, this issue, uh, this answer that you've gotten may not apply to this person. Because this person may be in a different situation, and there's a hundred different factors that could affect the way that this answer is provided, the way the answer is given. So just, I mean, just as a point of caution, um, I personally don't answer questions like this. On an on a open Q&A, somebody asks me a personal question, or a question that involves another party, I will just put it aside, right? A lot of them. <clears throat> Assalamu He asked me to say it in Urdu. Assalamu alaikum. Um, uh, I made a request to the ICNA organizers uh, to have a session in Urdu later at night. Um, and it's not for the kids, it's for the parents. Because you don't have to talk to them, which you don't understand in English. It can be only in Urdu. آپ میں سے کچھ لوگوں نے اردو میں سوال بھی بھیجا ہے اور اس سوال کا جواب میں دینا تو چاہتا ہوں لیکن اس سیشن میں نہیں میں چاہتا ہوں خاص بیٹھ کے آپ سے آرام سے بات ہو اگر آپ کو نیند نہیں آتی زیادہ تو ان سے درخواست کر کے تھوڑا بعد میں ٹائم لے کے آرام سے بیٹھ کے گپ شپ کرتے ہیں ٹھیک ہے اوکے اوکے دیٹس دیٹ اور یہ آئی اسپیک اٹ یا That's a lie. That's a lie. Is bichare ko do desiyon ke beech mein bitha diya. Yeah. Poor guy. Acha. It's pretty good, right? Are you done? You want to answer a question? <laughs> okay, just wait. All right. Is it permissible to approach someone you are interested in directly if you are unable to ask his or her family or parents? Um, two things. Number one, uh, it is very, very, very crucial as much as you can to involve your parents as you start the process. Uh, a lot of times what happens, and I think this is one of the biggest, biggest mistakes people make, They start the relationship, and then they go to the parents after they've started the relationship, even if, you know, mashallah, religious and all that kind of stuff. They act like angels, like you're standing in the way of me fulfilling my deen. And then they expect the parents to just accept it just like that. Uh, you would save yourself a lot of heartbreak, and you would put a lot more barakah in the process if you can involve the parents, meaning if the parents are alive or if you, whoever it would be considered the wali and whoever are the responsible parties from both sides, if you try to involve them from the start, Um, of that process. Uh, approaching someone you are interested in directly, if you're unable, it depends what unable to ask his or her family or parents means. Okay, if this is unable in a fiqhi, in, in fiqhi terminology, like unable as in like, 
they live in a country where there's no phones and they don't have access to email, all right, or something like that, then it's a different answer. I don't think that this is what it means. I think that if you're unable to ask his or her family or parents in the first place, then you should probably not be talking to that person because that means that you're not going to have the parents on board. As much as you can have the parents on board, you will keep the barakah in that relationship. Um, I also think that, and, and this is just something I want to add to a different question that's here, you know, talking about, you know, what to consider, and this is a really religious person. I think it's, it's, it's outside of the low self-esteem part, someone who's really, or I tend to view as really, really religious, and this is like, you know, the only, mashallah, sheikh in the world, this is the only sister in the world who's that religious. Look, if you've already made the mistakes that Sheikh Sa'ad talked about, which is allowed yourself to become infatuated with a person, started a relationship with a person in some way, and then started to consider religion, you will make that person religious even if they're not that religious. Okay? Right? It'll be like, all right, mashallah, they pray. Wow. Right? I actually had somebody tell me one time, Sheikh, mashallah, you know, the other night we were together and she read Surah Al-Rahman to me. I was like, <laughs> that's not... There's so much wrong with that, okay? She's not supposed to be reading Surah Al-Rahman to you, all right? But, but the, the thing is, you will make them out to be the most religious person in the world if you really want them to be religious. And that's not honest. You're not being honest to yourself, okay? So try to, try to from the very start, go about the process in the, in, a, in the right way. When you don't go about it in the right way, what you're going to end up with is a lot of heartbreak. Heartbreak from both of you, Heartbreak from the, on the parents on both ends, mistrust, all kinds of things are going to happen that are bad. So try to involve the parents from the very beginning or whoever the responsible parties uh, would be. And if they stand in the way, don't take matters into your own hands. Okay? Go to the imam. Try to get someone else involved. You know, your uncle, an aunt. Don't just say, okay, well, my parents are standing in the way and they don't have a legitimate reason. I can revoke his waliship. I can, we can just go ahead and do things behind their back, you know, and it's all good. Don't do that. Don't ever take matters into your own hand, and don't ever use your parents, and this is something that I see a lot of youth make this mistake, don't use your parents' refusal for the wrong reasons as an excuse to commit zina, or as an excuse to go too far in your talking and your conversation. So you know what? They're standing in the way. They're not being reasonable. And then if you guys mess up, you say, well, it's our parents' fault. They stood in the way. Didn't you hear the hadith uh, that if, if you reject uh, someone with deen and character, there will be fitna on this, on this earth, corruption, trials and tribulations. So we're just the result of that. Allah is still going to punish you. And He'll punish them too. Okay? He'll punish them for getting in the way of what could have been a good marriage, rejecting someone with good religion and character because of racism or because of cultural backwardness. They're going to have to be held accountable for that. And you will be accountable for not having a halal relationship. Okay? Now, as far as approaching someone for marriage in the first place, it's okay for brother or sister to say to someone else, you know, like that, that you're interested, to show interest. But again, as much as you can, involve some other parties that will save you, that will that, that'll place a safety net. Because you also lose your sense of, of ra I mean, you, you become very irrational once you start talking to somebody. Okay, and your standards change all of a sudden, and things that were inappropriate at first are not inappropriate anymore. And subhanAllah, it's just, it's just, you're just being led on. Okay, there's a gradual uh, development of a relationship there, and you're not paying attention anymore. So it's good to get someone there to make sure that you guys are going uh, about it in the right manner. Uh, one quick question, inshallah, and then I'll pass it on to Sheikh Hussein. Um, so there, there are a couple of Interesting questions here, but here's one. How to get parents on board with someone you want to marry, and how do you convince them if they don't agree for non-religious reasons like education or social status? Um, okay, so uh, I would argue, first of all, that a, re a, re a legitimate reason doesn't have to be religious. Uh, let's not be so monolithic about life. Like, uh, we, don't, we don't do this in any other aspect of life, right? So... Uh, and the, uh, if a child of, or if the proposing guy, I don't know if this is a guy or a girl asking this question, but if the other party, uh, if, let's say it's a guy, he doesn't have a job, he doesn't have a degree, he doesn't have a plan for one, but he prays five times a day. And he's got memorizing the Quran or whatever, right? So, um, and your parents say, well, he doesn't have any career. I mean, what are you going to do? Uh, 
well, that's a legitimate concern. That's not an unfounded concern. And you can't turn around to your parents and say, well, you don't have a shadowy reason to turn this down because you're only looking at his status. Yeah, I'm looking at his status. He doesn't have a job. What are you, you going to you gonna live? But I love him. Love will feed us. Yeah, it will feed you for like a week. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But so, so parents can have very legitimate concerns about this stuff. Parents can become very unreasonable. They can. They do. We'll talk later. Right? In Urdu. You can become very unreasonable. That's fine. But a lot of times they're not. You're the one being unreasonable. Right? So getting your parents on board, it, it can be a painful process. And it, it, we do need to have a very serious conversation with our parents about how wor the world has changed. And very quickly, I'll just say that, you know, a lot of times we have these forums and programs and, you know, MSAs and other, other platforms. Alhamdulillah, this platform also. This is a good conversation. This is a really big step forward, actually, for us even to be having this conversation in the Muslim community. Because all across the world, there's this problem and we aren't talking about it. We're actually not dealing with it. So this is, alhamdulillah, I'm very happy that we're actually even having this conversation. But I will tell you, we are becoming insensitive to one side. In other words, we're concerned about the problems that the youth don't get their voices heard and they don't get their concerns met and they can't marry someone who they want. Their parents are too cultural or too backwards or too bigoted or this or that or the other. But you know what? We're not considering the parents' point of view. Our parents, they, they, they were raised and they were married on a different continent in most cases with a completely different culture. And the United States, its own culture has changed in the last decade, not to mention the last half century. So they're living in a different planet. The standards they had for decency and appropriateness and socially acceptable things, especially when it comes to something as important as marriage, they were raised on certain standards. You can't humanly expect them to drop all of that and just you know, look at the world the way you do. You, it's not going to happen. That's just not going to happen. It's going to take some real patience and time and discussion to be able to let go of some of those things that they hold so dear. And they may not be religious things. So what? There are things that are a part of a person's identity is their culture or where they were brought up. That's a part of their identity. And it's very hard to let go of any part of your identity. You can't just say, where is this in the Quran and Sunnah and therefore you're not, your concerns are not legitimate. It doesn't work that way. It does not work that way. Just as you're committed to your culture. We have a culture too. Don't delude yourself into thinking that we just follow Quran and Sunnah. You're following American culture. Where is it in the Quran and Sunnah that you eat pizza? From your diet to the way you dress to the expressions you use, you follow a culture just as your parents did. And some things are normal to you in your culture and some very different things were normal to them in theirs. Right? So we have, we have this sensitivity towards ourselves but not to our parents. We've got to begin to at least respect and understand where they're coming from. Similarly, even in our masajid, which is a separate issue, we're not talking about that right now, but just as a to point, the idea of sensitivity. Yes, khutbah should be in English. Yes, Islamic program should be in English. Yes, we have a lot of masajid where the imam is, you know, either oh, everything's in Urdu or everything's in Arabic or everything's in, you know, uh, Swahili or something else, right? And it's like an immigrant masjid, we call them immigrant masjids. But you know what? There is a significant population of Muslims that live in this country that don't speak any English. They have needs too. They need to get an education too. They need inspiration also. I'm not saying one or the other. And the answer isn't we do away with everything the old generation needs. They have, you know, they're people also. That, that a healthy community will address their needs. They will have programs in local languages. And a lot of times this message, this is why I wanted to have an Urdu session. This is my rationale. This message should be presented in Arabic, in Ammiya, not in Fusha, in Ammiya. It should be presented in local, yeah, seriously, Haqqan. Or what do you say? Bizzabt? Yeah, Sahih. Okay, whatever. Anjad? Anjad. Okay, Anjad. Okay. Yeah, Ankulli Jaddin. Okay. But anyway, so uh, this needs to happen in local languages of the cultures of our parents, this conversation. You know why? Because that has a certain frequency, it breaks certain barriers, certain things become easier to understand. When your par you're talking to your parents in your, you know, your, your Texan accent, you're telling them, you don't understand me. You know, they, first of all, they don't even understand you if you're being nice. And on top of that, now you're talking to, yeah, Angrezi bol ke bade, bade taalim aagai hai, mujhe samjhao ge toh, 
بڑے بڑے الفاظ استعمال کر کے سمجھتا ہے بہت چیز بن گیا You know, because English is the language of the colonizer. You have to understand that, right? So they're like, you're being, they're being talked down to just because you're talking in English some, sometimes. So you, the language of respect to them is Urdu. And your Urdu is horrible. It's horrible. You can't talk to me. Like, you can't, like, you can't do it. You can't. Sorry, not you know, everybody's here this, but you know, that sounded funny in any language. So there is a barrier. There is a cultural barrier. You have to respect that barrier, and you have to work patiently with that barrier. Inshallah. That was my two cents. Quick housekeeping. Can I, can I uh, it, respond to him in a way? Not respond. I, I want to... This is sort of an... This will be my last advice. Actually, I'm not going to take another question, or we have to go. You got to get out of here? Make an announcement. Just watch. Okay. It is 12.10, and uh, for those who have to go, it's understandable. We are going to continue for a few more minutes, inshallah, with questions and answers. But uh, Fajr will be at 6 a.m. in this room. So keep that in mind, inshallah. Fajr will be at 6 a.m. in this room. Now we'll continue. Shalom. All right. Um, all right. What, what were you talking about? Parents, and you were ranting about Urdu and Arabic for a while. All right. Um, look. My last advice, and this is my advice to all of you, parents and children in particular, uh, when it comes to young people that want to get married, do not, from the very start, offend your parents and make them feel like they're being disregarded. Because if you do, it's only natural that you're going to turn this into a dispute of who controls who, and whether or not you have the right to do this without my approval, and so on and so forth. So don't turn this into a battle of authority from the very, very beginning. It's dangerous, and it's going to be... You know, somehow I've told people sometimes that want to get married and their parents stood in the way. I said, you know what, just go tell your mom and dad, you know what, mom, dad, I really want to marry that person. They're great for me. But if it's going to hurt you, then I'm not going to do it. I'd never want to hurt your feelings. You know what ends up happening? No, 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 let's talk about it. Inshallah, we can, we can work something out. You know, maybe we can talk about this and we can work something out. I don't want you to be depressed. And, and you know, you could, it takes a couple of weeks. You got to wear that, you know, Kelb al Hazin look, right? The puppy, puppy dog, you know, that puppy face, just sad dog face all the time. And, like, you know, I'm not going to eat the biryani tonight, all right? Or the makluba. Let's try to be more diverse about this, all right? No biryani, no makluba tonight. I'm going to go to sleep. No, I'm okay, mom. I'm okay. You know, then let them, let, let your parents feel like they are the most important parties in your life, because they are. And parents, at the same time, so this nasiha goes both ways. I think what, 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 what Norman just mentioned is very significant, which is that a lot of times these talks are very imbalanced. Like it's either to the youth, like, you know, your parents don't know what they're talking about and, and you know, just go, go ahead and do what you're going to do, or it's to the parents. And, you know, I don't think that's appropriate. I think that we need to look at both sides of the coin. For parents also, Try not to fall into that trap also. And you know what? There are going to be times where you're going to feel threatened, where you're going to feel like you weren't respected, where your kids went about this the wrong way. But try to think in their best interest. Don't let your ego get in the way of this. You have a right. You have a right to, to exercise all of your authority. But it's not the healthiest thing to do. Okay, because really, if, if your kids have, you know, you need, to, you need to have a rational discussion with someone that's not as emotionally invested as you. Take shura from someone who's more knowledgeable, from someone who's, who's more rational about the situation, and try to act in their best interest. Because look, love is a powerful thing, right? I know we had this entire thing talking about love and, and the misconceptions, and I agree, that was an outstanding, uh, mashallah, analysis of it. You know, but at the same time, we have to understand, it is a very powerful thing. And, you know, if, if, if the kids are really into this and they are, all the qualities are there and the only thing that's standing in the way is I don't like the way you went about it or I don't like the way you talked to me about it, right? Then try to let that go, forgive that and act in their best interest, inshallah ta'ala, and that will be healthier and better for everyone. So try to act like partners in this entire process. Do not disregard one another, especially kids, don't disregard your parents. There is nothing in the world worth the rilla, worth the pleasure of your parents. That's not to guilt you and to, you know, if later on in life, you know, uh, a conflict arises between mom and wife or the in-laws because everyone has their rights and you need to fulfill everyone's rights upon you. Sometimes the wife has a right upon you and the mom has no right to step in the way of that. 
That's not part of birr al-walidain to neglect your wife. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm saying, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's legitimate. You do not want to sacrifice the pleasure of your parents over anybody. At least, especially from the get-go. Especially from the get-go. And you know what? Whenever you have conflicts in marriage, do you know who you fall back on? Your parents, your families. If your families are against you and they don't want this to succeed, it's really not going to last very long. If your parents don't want it to work, her parents don't want to work, the first conflict and you go back and you talk to your parents or they send something is wrong, say, see, I told you so. You should have listened to me. Right? It's, it's going to fall apart from the very start. And, and at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would definitely withhold the barakah of that relationship if the parents were unjustifiably upset okay, or, or justifiably upset, I'm sorry, if, if you wronged them okay, and, 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 and you took away that right from them. You know, we have to also be sensitive, and, and I really mean this, you know, you, lo you know how long your parents have planned out you know, the day that they would see you get married and they would be there for you, right? And they, and they would see that special day. You know, don't take that away from them. That's something that's very special. Unless, again, you really, really have to. But don't do it without justification. Okay, don't take that moment away from them. Um, I told, I, I'm not even going to go, because I get very emotional if I do this. I won't go into detail of the story. I'll just say that my mother passed away between my nikah and my wedding. And it was a very difficult thing. And I, till now, I always say, alhamdulillah, she was pleased with me and she was pleased with my choice. Alhamdulillah. She was part of that process. Alhamdulillah. I don't know what I would have done to myself. You know, Norman was, was one of my friends who was close brothers who was there for me at that time. And I used to always tell you this, right? Alhamdulillah, she was pleased. She was happy. She was, she was happy with that choice. Had she not been, I probably would have, like, you know, overdosed or something like that. Something very bad would have happened because I would have been miserable. Uh, more miserable than I already was. Okay? Don't do that. And subhanAllah, it's out of nowhere. Don't do that. Don't do something that's going to sacrifice their pleasure because on the day of judgment, that's still your middle gate to Jannah. It's your middle gate to Jannah. If they step in the way, وَإِن جَاهَدَاكَ لِتُشْرِكَ بِمَا لَيْسَ لَكَ بِهِ عِلْمٍ فَلَا تُطِعْهُمَا Just don't follow them whenever they tell you to do something wrong. Okay, whenever they tell you to do something that لَا طَاعَةً لِمَخْلُوقٍ فِي مَعْصِيَةِ الْخَالِقِ As the Prophet ﷺ said, you can't obey a creation when it means disobeying the Creator. It is disobedience to the Creator to mistreat your wife. It is disobedience to the Creator to mistreat your wife because those are God-given rights. So even if the mother-in-law demands that, that's, you know, you're just going to have to say, look, mom, I've got to give her her rights. That's, that's cultural. That's purely cultural whenever a person is tortured by their in-laws on the basis of, well, she's my mom, I have to listen to her. Okay? But again, from the, from the start, from the get-go, try to, especially young people, try to involve your parents, try to take into consideration their feelings, Try to, say, try to show them that they are the most important thing in the world. They are the most important people in the world to you. And I'm not going to, to flush a 21-year-old relationship that began with my existence down the toilet because of someone that I've known for two months. That's very inconsiderate. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not... Don't, don't pull out any ayat or kitab and sunnah and say deen and khuluq are there and religion and character. That's wrong. That's messed up. And it will come back to you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will test you in that way with your children. So try, again, parents to think in the best interest of your children and children to be as considerate as possible of your parents from the get-go and not make them feel like they're being disregarded and that they're, ir ir that they're not relevant to this process or they're not, uh, they're not to be taken into consideration. That's the last thing I'm going to say, so I'll pass it on to you. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu salam ala rasulullah. I'll give you my final parting advice, inshallah ta'ala. Uh, one of the, uh, this is a common theme I see between a lot of these questions, and that is uh, people are, they're dealing with issues, their personal issues, um, things where you'll find that it's not a black and white answer. And I think one of the things that you'll realize in the answers that uh, Brother Norman gave and uh, Sheikh Umar gave is that they didn't give you a clear answer in a lot of this stuff. They didn't say, yes, do it, or no, don't do it. And they, there's a lot of gray area, and there's a lot of, uh, lot of situations where there's, there's, there's truth on this side, and there's truth on that side, and they have their, their, their point of view, and they have their point of view here, and that needs to be taken into consideration. And I don't, I don't want that people leave here just like confused and be like, I just don't know what's right and what's wrong. And so the one thing I can tell you, like your way out of that, is always, always, always seek the counsel of people who are experienced and people who have knowledge in the issues that you are dealing with. Right? And this is why we know one of the sunnahs of the Prophet 
is that he would seek counsel. وشاورهم في الأمر that seek their مشورة in your matters. And Allah subhanahu wa taala is not speaking here about any individual. Allah subhanahu wa taala is speaking about the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Who, if there's any individual who doesn't need to seek counsel, it's the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yet the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would seek the counsel of other people, his wife and others, as we know. Right? So always have someone in your life, and I know it's difficult sometimes, but you know, whether it's your imam or, or someone, and like I said, it's not, it's not, it doesn't always have to be someone who's a scholar or a sheikh or someone who studied in Medina or here and there. Maybe it's someone who is simply experienced in the issues that you're dealing with. Right? But always seek counsel from someone before you make decisions. Even before you think about making decisions sometimes, seek the counsel, go to your imam, go to a local scholar, and one of the other things that really, really irks me, subhanAllah, really bothers me, is how people have started to ignore people of knowledge in their own communities because they're not a celebrity. They don't have like 100,000 uh, likes on Facebook or all these followers on Twitter, and, and they don't have like a million YouTube videos, so they think maybe this person, right, this, this is not the right person to seek advice from. Yeah, we have many, many, like, for example, Sheikh Salah Sawi, we have, he lives here in Houston? He lives here in Houston. And SubhanAllah, Houston is actually a city which you actually have a lot of people of knowledge in this city out of, compared to a lot of other places in America. I know personally, I know at least, I can count at least five people in the city of Houston that I know personally that are well, well qualified to answer pretty much all of the questions that are up here. And not only are they qualified, they have this other condition that needs to be fulfilled when you go to someone for advice, and that is that they should be accessible, right? I don't know about the, 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 my two brothers here, but I know for myself, it's very, I, I don't, I consider myself to be very unaccessible, right? It's, it's hard to get in touch with me. I get that. It's very difficult. And most speakers who are on like the national circuit or an international circuit, it is difficult, unless like they're an imam of a community or something. But you have people. Every community has people of knowledge. Take advantage of those people. Get their advice get their counsel, and take it seriously before you make any decision, inshaAllah ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Safar tu ilaik. Okay, inshaAllah. Uh, I think it's more reasonable. We'll have the Urdu thing tomorrow night, inshaAllah. It's too late tonight. Too late tonight, inshaAllah. We'll do it tomorrow night, inshaAllah. I promise.